They say that um, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. How, you do, how do you do with your, with your breakfast? It takes a bit of work, actually, doesn't it? But it really does make a difference. It's healthy. It uh, sustains your energy levels during the day. It boosts your metabolism. It's uh, good for your, um, uh, for your heart. And it's good for your brain. It's a really important thing to do. Start the day well. But what if there was a sort of spiritual equivalent of that? What does it look like to start the day in here and in here to start it well? Because my danger is I often am tempted to start it quite badly. I wake up, especially this morning with the clocks going forward. And um, I'm feeling not quite sure what I'm doing. And the first thing I'll do is I'll reach for my phone and then flick through some stuff, maybe a little bit of social media, check some messages, start reading the news. And I'm not sure any of that's really very good for me. It tends to sort of remind me of all the things I've got to do or all of the things that I, um, that I want that I don't have. It tends to sort of feed the parts of me which aren't really very helpful. And so, um, you know, looking at how other people's lives look and comparing myself to that feeds my uh, envy. Uh, it feeds my vanity. It might feed my pride or my greed, or when I read the news, it might feed my anger. And I'm not sure in the long term that that's a very good thing. It's likely to stress me out, cause anxiety. I suspect there are better ways to start the day than that, but it takes a little bit of discipline. Now, we're at the end of this series on the Lord's Prayer, and I just wanted to sort of wrap it up and reflect a little bit on the journey it's been a really amazing thing. I've had some great conversations with people about looking afresh at something which was so familiar and finding real kind of hidden depths there. And it's been lovely to hear lots of you talking about the fact that you've been praying it nearly every day and how good you've found that. But I guess I sort of just want to zoom out and think about what the Lord's Prayer is sort of on the bigger picture because it's an amazing thing. It's... Um, it's not just a prayer, it's more than that. And um, in many ways, it's a sort of a model for the whole of what it means to follow Jesus. It's the sort of the essence of the Christian life. Get this and you won't go too far wrong. I think it's a, it's a work of sort of, I don't know, it, it reflects quite how brilliant Jesus is actually. You'd expect me to say that. But it does, his ability to sum up so much kind of complex ideas into a simple prayer, I think is a wonderful thing. If you wanted to write what it means to be a Christian on a post-it note for anybody to read, you, do, you, you, you would struggle to do any better than this. And I think it, it is a really good way to start the day. It's like a condensed shot of goodness spiritual goodness which sets us up well and i've got three things that i think uh, it does for us if we take this on as a sort of as a model and a way to um, to live our lives first thing i think it does is it wakes us up it wakes us up to how the world really is i think one of the problems we have is that we live in a world where our own hearts and I don't know, the sort of the society that we're a, a, a part of is so individualistic. It's so much about me. And although, you know, it's really obvious that you and I are not the center of the universe, we sort of act like that's the case, don't we? And I feel like that's marketed at us. You know, we're sold stuff because, because we're worth it, because you're so important. And what the Lord's Prayer does is reminds us that we're not the center of the universe, and it's no good thinking that we are. If we think we're the center of the universe, we're just going to be frustrated. No, we're woken up to the reality that actually, when we pray, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, we're talking about God, who is, of course, at the very center of all creation. And what matters in life is his purposes, his will being done. That's where we find life. That's where other people find freedom and joy and peace. And don't forget, we talked about the fact that we pray in the plural. We say, 
our Father. It's not about me. I'm part of a, an amazing family, an amazing community of which you are a, a, a really important part of. When we pray, we're reminded of our brothers and sisters, our, our part in the people of God, which is the church. So it sort of wakes us up to the reality of our place in the world. It puts us in the right place. And I think that's a really blessed and important thing to do. It reminds us, of course, as well, of our need for forgiveness and our need to forgive other people. And that important, difficult journey of reconciliation. So it wakes us up to the world as it actually is, not the world that we slightly pretend to inhabit. Secondly, it's like a compass which orients us in the right direction. Again, I'm sure you've had that experience of, um, of just getting lost along the way. And I don't mean that just practically. I mean, you know, if you've ever been for a walk through, through a big city and taken a wrong turn, and that weird experience of being like, I can't actually remember how I got here and where I'm going. But of course, there's a sort of spiritual version of that, isn't there? Where is this life going? What am I doing? What's the purpose of this? What's important? And what the Lord's Prayer does, if we take it on as a, as a model for our lives, is it reminds us which way is up, what is really important. And as we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, we're reminded that God's purposes for our lives are the best things for us. Those are the things that we should be seeking like the compass which orients us towards God and his purpose. And as we pray, lead us not into temptation, we're reminded that experience of, of life with all of its trials and troubles, and that God is the one who can navigate us safely through that and lead us home. So it wakes us up. It's like a compass which points us in the right direction, which shows us true north. Thirdly, it's a, a, found, a firm foundation upon which we can build our lives. And um, there's a really interesting detail in this. You know, I think it's wonderful that the Lord's Prayer is something that we have uh, memorized. You know, it just, it, 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 there's something magical about the fact that it sort of goes in and it stays. Um, and we're really familiar with it. Sometimes that's a problem, but, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a brilliant thing that it's there. But did you spot the really interesting thing that in Luke's gospel, which we had read, it looks slightly different? Isn't that interesting? And what that would suggest is that when Jesus was teaching people to pray, it didn't always look exactly the same. And that in many ways, this is the Luke's gospel, this is a slightly simpler version. The Matthew's gospel is a sort of expanded version of the Lord's Prayer. It's the extended remix. But there's that nice idea that actually what the Lord's Prayer is, it, it is a prayer to be prayed, but it's also a starting point for our prayers. And uh, so there's an interesting moment where in the, the Luke's version, um, uh, Jesus says, pray thy kingdom come. And then in the Matthew's version, he sort of extrapolates on that. So he says, pray thy kingdom come, which means thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you see? And I, I think there's this kind of idea that each of the lines of the Lord's Prayer can be a starting point for our prayers, can be something that we can meditate on and reflect on. And so that our life and our prayers should absolutely reflect this. It should look something like the Lord's Prayer. But it doesn't have to look exactly like this, that it can, um, to be, uh, you can reflect and grow and develop on the themes that come out of this. But I would say that this still has to be the model. I think there's a real danger because of the nature of our world that our prayer can become a little bit too self-centered. And what the Lord's Prayer does is consistently turns us outward towards others, towards God, towards the bigger picture of the world. So I, do you see, it's a, it's a really good sort of model and a good foundation for the, the lives that we live, the way that we think, and the way that we pray. But whatever we think about it, one of the things that's wonderful about it is it, 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 it's, 
it seems to be like a key that opens a door. Someone said that um, the Lord's Prayer is like the key to the whole business of living well. It does, it sort of opens that door. But I was really struck reflecting on the, 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 the story that came after the Lord's Prayer in this, that whole theme of the need to ask. Because I don't know that we always think that. We always think, well, God's good. He'll give me the things that I need. And yet there is this sense in which God so respects our freedom, probably in ways that aren't very good for us, but nevertheless, he does that. He respects our will and our dignity. And so there's this sense that you actually really have to ask. And that's true all the way through the Christian life, but it's especially true at the beginning of the Christian life. That you need to knock at the door. You need to seek. You need to ask before you receive. Isn't that an interesting thing? Are you conscious of that? Conscious of the fact that God has all of this blessing for you, but that it's held until you ask for it, until you seek it, until you knock at the door. And to do those things is the easiest thing in the world. It's not hard, it's not complicated, but it still needs to be done. You need to make a choice about what you want from life. It's not a fascinating thought. Our Dignity as human beings, as people made in the image of God, is so important that God waits until we come seeking and knocking and asking before the door opens for us. Is that something that you need to do tonight? The easiest thing in the world, but perhaps the most important. A couple of last reflections. What about the last bit? Um, So you will be really familiar with the fact that the Lord's Prayer finishes with the words, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Is that that the version that you pray? Have you had the experience of going to a Catholic church and then they don't pray that? Have you not had that experience? They don't. And have you noticed that that's not in the Bible text? So the question is, well, where did that come from? And the answer is, it is a little piece of medieval liturgy. It's called a doxology. It was used to, add, to it was added to the end of any number of important things. So often the Psalms will have a little doxology at the end. And the Lord's Prayer had a little doxology at the end. And in Cramner's prayer book in 1662, um, he included the doxology in the Lord's Prayer. And then the prayer book, which is one of the most influential Um, pieces of writing in the English language meant that everybody for 400 years has learned the Lord's Prayer with the doxology attached, so much so that we think that that's normal. It's fine. Pray it, don't pray it, doesn't matter too much. I'm not sure it adds a great deal to the prayer itself. We continue to pray it because it's all very nice, but that's why I'm not preaching a sermon on the doxology. And um, yeah, I think the last thing I want to say is that um, I'd love you to sort of really hold on to the Lord's Prayer as something foundational. Wherever we go from here, whatever we learn, whatever we're taught, I don't think you ever really move beyond the Lord's Prayer. And if life starts to look different to this, well, we need to sort of correct ourselves. That um, when Jesus was asked by his disciples to teach them to pray, and to pray isn't just to say a prayer, it's to, it's to live a life, it's to, uh, it's to follow Jesus. That this is what it looks like. It's an amazing thing. It's the simplest thing in the world, and yet it's got depths beyond what we realize. And, um, and I'd love to encourage you to start the day well. Choose better ways to start your days. Leave the phone on the side. Leave it, you know, switched onto to flight mode so that it doesn't have um, things to disturb you. Stay off the screens, even leave the newspapers aside. Start the day with some time just of quiet and of prayer and it will set you up for a better day and life is given just like that, day by day. What the Lord's Prayer does is it wakes us up 
to the world as it really is. It wakes us up to God's reality. It, it orients us in the right direction. It points us towards God's purposes in the world and the things that we hope for. And um, it acts as a foundation for our lives. And you will not go too far wrong if that is the foundation of your life. It is, of course, greater than we can imagine because one day this prayer will be answered. I can't always promise that for our prayers. You know, sometimes we pray for stuff and we don't know whether the God is actually going to answer it in the way that, um, that we'd like it to. But this prayer, I've got some confidence that this is going to be answered. That one day, um, the kingdom will come. God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. One day, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the water covers the sea. One day, it will be on earth as it is in heaven, and then it all will be well. And until that day, we pray this prayer.